Welcome. Welcome, everybody, to our panel on Join Hands for Peace. I'm Dawn Ely, and I'll be your chair for this evening. But before I tell much about myself, I really want to spend some time introducing our very esteemed panelists here. Uh, we have some wonderful people joining us for this topic. I'd first like to point out to uh, Ambassador Kishore Mabubani. He's a distinguished fellow in Asia Research Institute at National University of Singapore. He spent 33 years as a Singapore diplomat with roles including Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador to the UN, and has had an illustrious career in academia and is a prolific author. He's been listed as a top global thinker, has received the U.S. Foreign Policy Association Medal, and was awarded the Public Administration Medal by the Singaporean government. Ambassador Karat Sarabai is the Executive Director of the Conference on Interaction and Confidence Building Measure in Asia, or SICA. He's been a diplomat for the Republic of Kazakhstan since 91, serving as Head of Protocol Service, Press Secretary, Head of Press Service, Deputy Foreign Minister, Assistant to the President on Foreign Policy Issues, and has served as Ambassador to several countries, including Austria, Germany, Slovenia, and Turkey. He's the author of several books and has actively sought out lecturer both domestically and internationally. He graduated in Oriental Studies from the Leningrad State University and is fluent in five languages. Ms. Sakai Holland, she is chair and board of trustees for the Zimbabwe Peace Initiative. She's a former senator in the Zimbabwean parliament and served as Zimbabwe's co-minister of state for national healing, reconciliation and integration, as well as its secretary for policy and research. She was a founder of Australia's anti-apartheid movement in the late 60s and has dedicated her life to human rights, democracy and the empowerment of women. She has received the French Legion of Honor, the Sydney Peace Prize and honorary doctorates from several universities. Dr. William McGee, Jr. He is co-founder and chief executive officer of Operation Smile. He's a plastic and craniofacial surgeon who received his DDS from the University of Maryland, his MD from George Washington University, and holds several other honorary doctorates. He's a featured TV guest and sought after keynote speaker who was highlighted in U.S. News and World Report as one of America's top leaders. He received the National Medal for Peace and Friendship among Nations in Vietnam, a special recognition award by UNICEF, and the Distinguished Service Award from the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. Luis Guiardo is the founder and president of the World Happiness Foundation. He's a social innovator and entrepreneur and former managing director of global brand and marketing for Deloitte, and he was instrumental in Deloitte's attaining the number one global professional services practice in 2010. He's the author of several books and teaches reputation and brand management at several global academic institutions. He's a frequent keynote speaker around the world on branding and how to think holistically and act personally. And his gross global happiness executive program has been adopted at the UN's University of Peace. He earned an MBA from Switzerland's Institute for Management Development and an MA in International Relations from Lancaster in the UK with undergraduate degrees in political science and international relations. And yours truly, uh, myself, Dawn Ely, I am founder and CEO at Palladium Group International and the nonprofit Illuminate from Hate. I've been a C-level executive for more than 20 years, managing billion dollar budgets and providing strategic direction across global business units. I'm a frequent speaker and leader of seminars on life sciences, international trade and business, personal empowerment, self-development, leadership, culture conflict, and conflict management. I've served as the president of the World Trade Center of Atlanta and on several international boards and executive committees, and I've created several personal development and conflict management programs, one of which was published in a book form last fall. I'm a double major graduate in English and Distinguished Honors Political and Social Thought from the University of Virginia, a law graduate from Mercer University, and in process of a Master's of Divinity of Peacemaking. So that's our panel for this evening, folks. Uh, I know that you're going to be very encouraged and happy to hear from what they say. So I'm going to start us off, and our topic tonight is joining hands for peace. How do we do it? What is stopping us from it? The first piece of place, in my opinion, we need to look is internally. COVID helped us start an internal focus because it stopped us from all the doingness and allowed us an opportunity to check in with our beingness the reality that is that our present state of affairs is and always will be a reflection of our collective individual state of affairs, our mindsets and our consciousness states. We will always live in an environment that reflects the axiom as within, so without. The vast majority of people live the majority of their lives in their egoic consciousness states, which is defined by polarized beliefs of us, them, good, bad, right, wrong, and zero-sum perspectives with value systems that prioritize power, control, dominion, and money over most other things. This polarized perspective sees problems, fears, and what is wrong with differences viewed as bad before it sees synergies and commonalities. This tinted egoic lens induces us to want to separate from others and see them as different wrong, bad, or less than. This is the root of our conflicts. 
when we can become aware of the ego's role in our belief systems, our perspectives, and develop true self-mastery and put our egos in the back seat where they belong, we can begin to live more from our higher self in the driver's seat, which sees the commonalities more than differences without the desire for separation of them from us. So I'd like to start us off from the panel, and I would like to invite uh, Mr. Luis Gallardo. Tell us your perspective on this topic. Well, thank you so much. Um, I love what you said, <laughs> honestly. And and actually what we do at the World Happiness Foundation and, and the World Happiness Fest, we are right in the middle because March 20th is International Day of Happiness. And there are two major resolutions approved by 194 countries uh, at the United Nations. One of them is to celebrate happiness as a human right. The second one is to create a development programs and new paradigms for human progress focused on happiness and well-being. So when I think of happiness, I understand happiness as the combination of freedom, consciousness, and being. And this is very much related to you to what you said. I still remember when I did my MA in peace, studied at Richardson Institute in the United Kingdom, and I being with as, a, as an international observer with the UN in multiple conflicts. And something that truly stuck me is that we keep talking about processes, we keep talking about policies, we keep talking about uh, tangible assets, and we don't talk and we don't focus enough on intangible assets and feelings. So peace is about inner peace. And we can keep talking about treaties, we can keep talking about processes, and we can keep talking about tools. But if we don't really focus on what really brings peace to the world, which is inner peace, we are not gonna achieve what we really want to achieve as humankind. We have too many labels. We have too many recognitions. We have too many medals. We have too many countries in many ways. Uh, so I don't want to be an agitator just yet, but it's very important that we understand that we are humankind. And when we understand that we are humankind, we have to go deeper into our inner being in order to fix and solve conflict. We cannot start the house by the roof, focusing on policies and focusing on processes with forgetting the most important part, which is actually our inner being. Fantastic. Thank you so much, um, Luis. Uh, wonderful topics and things to think about. So now I'd like to invite uh, Ms. Sakai Holland. Please tell us your perspective on this topic. Thank you very much for including Africa in these uh, processes, because listening to what you say and what the first speaker has just said, I believe that um, rebuilding trust which is the theme of this uh, meeting, um, is where we really should begin to look at. Because in Zimbabwe, um, 1890 threw us out of our historical trajectory into the modern world as defined by others. And our voice and our understanding of self, of what life is about, has really been obliterated from the mainstream. So rebuilding trust. Throughout our society for those that really come to Africa. The COVID um, pandemic in Western countries really highlighted the fragility of those societies. I'm following the questions that you put to us, especially in Western democracies in the North. And strangely, in Australasia, there has been very little impact. Um, I'm meaning Australia, the Pacific, Asia, the, we don't see much impact there. Uh, they have put in place measures that are inclusive, recognize diversity, and uh, their minorities are included in the benefits. Whereas when you look at the Northern advanced Western democracies, the historical, um, really terrible histories have 
prevented the northern countries, the United States, the United Kingdom, Europe, into understanding how to deal with like the African Americans, the Native Americans, and so the impact of the COVID pandemic on this uh, societies is very different while they're within Western societies. In Africa, we were terrified because the West told us that the pandemic would devastate Africa and we would actually be totally destroyed. What's been very interesting is that we believe that and our government, for example, in Zimbabwe, followed to the letter the World Health Organization measures. And we still are on those lockdowns, masking, everything. At the same time, the most marginalized because of our really bad safety nets, weak infrastructures of health, we found that the grassroots reverted back and guided us into our traditions, the herbs, the diets, uh, the treatments that are organic and grassroots based and really in our backyards, we all have reverted to those. Actually emerging out of a Western stupor that we don't have anything, we now realize that what we are calling weeds are actually the medications that we have abandoned for like in Zimbabwe, more than a hundred yeah. years. That's wonderful. Um, so uh, Ms. Holland, do you want to uh, make a, a final statement before we uh, move into the other portion of the, the conversation? Oh, well, what I want to say here is that the civil society organizations, the government have been forced to come up with an understanding of how we connect with the new world where you are Wi-Fi connected, digitalized, educated to understand the Um, that was a wonderful opening statement, and uh, we'll come back to uh, Ms. Holland in a moment. But for now, I'd like to uh, offer and um, invite Mr. Uh, Dr. Bill McGee to give his statement. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be with all of you and an honor to be with all of you and to meet you virtually like this. And I can tell you that uh, I have learned a lot over the 38 years of being involved with the Operation Smile. And I can tell you that uh, it is something that really has taken me back to the reality of, of life and what it's like and its difficulties. Um, you know, when we first went to uh, the Philippines, uh, it was something that was extremely difficult for us. Um, it was something that we uh, had to see and turn away literally hundreds of people who were born with cleft lips or cleft palates. And imagine if this were your child and you were wondering, how am I ever going to get my child to have a normal life? You can see the emotion on the faces of a mother when she sees their child for the very first time in the recovery room. In that situation, there is no difference between all of us. The emotion of that moment triggers us to be centered. But yet the reality is there's probably 5 million people around our world who never have access to this care. And yet when you take care of somebody, there is no difference in race, religion, or culture. Everybody is together in that process. I'll never forget this gentleman who was a, a farmer, earned $100 a year. His 13-year-old daughter, he didn't even have any idea that she could get her lip fixed. And when we took care of her, and as little as 45 minutes, you have a child that now, in real life, is part of an accounting firm in Panama City, where she had never been even to school before for the lack of a 45-minute operation. What makes children so important to all of us? Why did we have a chance back in the early 90s to be able to go to Gaza in the West Bank? We took our 16-year-old daughter, the youngest of our five children at the time, and Yasser Arafat said, were you afraid to come here? I said, no. In fact, we brought our 16-year-old daughter. He said, have her come up here and get a photo with us. Why did all of a sudden the differences between his philosophy on life and our philosophy on life make no difference? 
If we then took a, a step many years ago, up to two years ago, why were we with President Ortega in Nicaragua at his home from 9 to 11 at night to talk about how we could help children in Bonanza and Siuna in the northeast part of that country? It was because of children that united us. Why, about 30 years ago, did we know Mr. Dr. Lee Dukan, President Lee Dukan in Vietnam? It was because of children that I'll talk a little bit about later. And the reality is, is that all of us have to realize, what if that were our child? What would we do to make sure that child was taken care of? We would do anything. And that's what we need to present to our leaders in the world. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. McGee. Excellent. So now I, for opening statements, I would like to invite Ambassador Sarabai to tell us his perspective on the topic of joining Hands for Peace. Thank you. Very good morning from uh, steps of uh, Kazakhstan. Uh, we enjoying already the new day. Uh, and I'm speaking on behalf of the conference on interaction and conference building measures in Asia, in short, SICA, a multinational forum founded over 20 years ago for enhancing cooperation to promote peace, security, and stability in Asia. Today, our forum unites 27 states of Asia, covering above 90% of the continent, stretching from the Pacific to the Mediterranean, from Ural to the Indian Ocean, with over half of world population. Looking at proposed topic from the perspective of such a broad international platform as SICA, I will focus my remarks on introducing SICA's added value to global security in our approach to strengthening multilateralism. The SICA Charter of 2002, known as Almaty Act, reaffirms its member states' commitment to the UN Charter, and they believe that peace and security in Asia can be achieved only through dialogue and cooperation. SICA aims at creating an effective mechanism for multilateral cooperation, preventive diplomacy, and peaceful settlement of disputes to achieve regional and global security. The philosophy of SICA is a gradual expansion of the common ground by interacting in areas that do not raise concerns among any of our member states. The product of our collaboration is trust, which is a fundamental pillar of security, and consensus is the primary rule of decision-making. Diversity in the political systems, economies, cultures of the SICA member states is our asset. We build on our differences to develop new approaches to strengthen security that are acceptable for all member states. All member states are equal. This approach fully meets the UN norm of equality of voices of all members of the international community. In 2007, SICA was granted the high status of UN General Assembly Observer. The SICA member states are consistently taking practical steps to achieve SICA objectives. The SICA Catalog of Confidence Building Measures is a unique tool which enables member states to build trust, cooperation and security through specific practical actions. It represents a dynamic and forward-looking roadmap for coordinated activities of member states. For instance, we have SICA plan for this year, over 50 CBMs in five dimensions to be hosted by member states on voluntary basis. Our latest developments include introduction of the new confidence building measure in the field of epidemiological security, as well as assistance to SICA member states in greatest need to their fight against COVID pandemic. Humanitarian aid was provided to Afghanistan, Palestine and Iraq in our headquarters in Kazakhstan just about two weeks ago. In the time allotted to me, I presented the facts on how SICA joins hands of 27 Asian states to contribute to global peace and security. And now I'm ready to answer questions uh, from all esteemed panelists or our distinguished uh, audience. Thank you, Don. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And we'll have some questions for you in a moment. Um, before we get there, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, again and uh, invite uh, Professor and Pasta Ambassador uh, Mabubani to give us his first opening three-minute uh, statement on the topic. Uh, thank you very much, 
uh, Don, for including me at the last minute. Uh, and I'm especially happy to join you because one of my roles is to serve as the uh, coordinator of the Asian Peace Program uh, at the National University of Singapore. So you can Google and get information on the Asian Peace Program. But I want to speak today in my capacity as a, someone who served in the UN for 10 years as an ambassador because the theme of our session is joining hands for peace. Now, as you know, to join hands for peace, the six of us cannot join our hands because we are in a virtual world, right? We can't touch each other. But there's one place in the world where 7.5 billion people can touch hands with each other. And that one place is the UN General Assembly. So if you want to create world peace, then surely what you should do is to strengthen the United Nations General Assembly. And sadly, what I learned in my 10 years as ambassador to the UN is that the West has been weakening the UN General Assembly. And that's a huge strategic mistake. And I'll explain why. Because if you look at, you know, you, you set the context on. You explain how COVID-19 has changed our world. And if there's one message that COVID-19 is sending to humanity, is that in the past when 7.5 billion people live in uh, 193 separate countries, it was as though they were living in 193 separate boats with captains and crews taking care of each boat. So if you're living in different boats, why do you worry if another boat gets COVID-19? But the world has shrunk. We no longer live in 193 separate boats. So in this world of today, 7.5 billion people live on 193 separate cabins on the same boat. So if you're on the same boat, isn't it stupid to take care of your cabin and not take care of the boat? Isn't that stupid? But that's exactly what humanity is doing now. This is crazy. And can you imagine at the height of COVID-19, when humanity needed to cooperate, the United States leaves the World Health Organization. That's absolutely crazy. I'm glad that Joe Biden had come back in, but that's not enough. What we need to do today is to strengthen the one institution that can bring us together, which is the United Nations and the United Nations General Assembly. And I think that that's what we should focus on in this coming decade if you want to join hands for peace. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. I appreciate those comments uh, more than you know. Um, so now I would actually like to um, start off with some questions. And for those who are in the audience, uh, feel free to uh, write in comments as well. I'm not sure if we're going to have extra time, but if we do, we will take some of your questions. But the first question I'd like to start off with is um, leading from uh, Professor and Ambassador uh, Mobani's Mo uh, comments, is how do we focus on the com commonalities while still respecting, maybe even celebrating our differences? Um, as you mentioned, there is a tremendous pull of tribalism through the populism that exists today, and it often doesn't want to compromise or focus just on common interests because they feel their interests are being suppressed or reduced down to lowest common denominator. Can we have a focus from these multilateral organizations on both commonalities while still celebrating differences and how do we do that? How do we help our representatives in these organizations who have a dual sense of loyalty to the home and local front and to the international communal front? Um, how do we address those tribalism pressures from home um, and still facilitate multilateralism? So I'd like to offer um, uh, Ambassador um, Sarabai, to start us off with that question. Thank you so much. As I said, uh, the SICA has developed and agreed on common fundamental principles uniting all member states. That was back in 1999, as member states agreed on declaration of principles guiding relations between SICA member states. That was the very starting point of SICA. And this is the fundamental basis uh, uh, on, on the agreed common objectives and goals of all member states and concrete measures to build confidence through specific activities in the areas of interest to all. 
That was uh, reflected in the Almaty Act, which is a charter of SICA. And I mentioned the very unique tool in the international relation of the catalog of CBMs. So uh, what we do have, we have a continuous dialogue over almost 20 years. And that was also reflected in declarations of uh, summit meetings or ministerial meetings, uh, which are regularly holding. And modus operandi is key. Consensus as the primary decision-making rule ensures mutual trust and focus on commonalities. You cannot agree on commonalities without consensus. And practical work and specific SICA activities are driven by member states in a non-intrusive way. Confidence-building measures are put in practice through concrete agreed activities under stewardship of any voluntary member states and for the benefit of all others. So I think that this approach strengthens ownership of member states over the entire process, demonstrates benefits of multilateral approach within the SICA framework and ensures, as you said, the celebration of differences. And this is our added value of diversity. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Um, and Professor uh, Mabubani, I would like for you to uh, have a shot at that question as well. I, I move and try and give a what may seem like a very simple answer, but sometimes complicated problems have very simple answers. Because, you know, if you look at the world's population, 12% live in the West, 88% live outside the West. Now, if 12% live in the West, 12% of the West should understand that their, that their fate is now tied to the remaining 88%. They should be working with the remaining 88% to create a better world for all of us. But to do that, as I said, you need to strengthen the United Nations. Now, one secret I'm going to give away is that sadly, there has been a campaign by the West to weaken the United Nations and weakens the United Nations family of organizations. And they've done this, by the way, by cutting down the financial financing of UN organizations. And so, for example, the World Health Organization, which is important for COVID-19, the, the contribution of compulsory contribution to the World Health Organization has gone down from 70% to 18%. 70% to 18, 18%. Now, that's obviously you're weakening an organization if you cut down the mandatory contributions. The West does it because they want to rely on voluntary contributions, then they control the agenda. Now, this is unwise. So there is one silver, simple silver bullet to strengthen the UN, raise the mandatory contributions back from 18% to 70%. There's no, you don't need to give more money. The money involved is the same, but you raise the compulsory con contribution and then these organizations can plan for the long term. Anyone who runs an organization knows that you just have to rely on voluntary contributions, you will die after a while. And that's why this is a very simple silver bullet solution, which I've advocated in my book, The Great Convergence. And if the West does it tomorrow, in a few years' time, the UN family will become much stronger and then we'll have a better world. Excellent. Thank you so much. I uh, appreciate that, Professor. Um, Ms. Sakai Holland, I'd love to hear your perspective on that question. And we Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, um, Sakai. Okay. We're having a bit of a problem with our technology. I thought I had a separate question myself. Am I answering the same one? Yes. Yes. And then you will also be set for another question as well. So you have two questions. Okay. okay. Um, I think that uh, what um, the last speaker said is really important for us in Africa to understand. Because one reality that we recognize in Africa is that we are on our own. And uh, the obsession that is there among us to actually be very Western is slowly dying as we realize that we are on our own. So um, my take with what's going on now with the COVID, 
uh, the pandemic is that yesterday our government announced, for example, that all the universities must now go into looking at a COVID-19, not vaccine, just a cure using our herbal treatments and all that. But it's not going to be something that's done overnight. They want to start a process where we look at what we have is what we use instead of looking at imports, instead of relying on uh, international trade as defined by the West. Okay. So All right. I think that um, uh, the COVID pandemic has really changed a lot of things which we are not looking at. For example, Zimbabwe. Okay, Ms. Holland, I'm so sorry. I hate to cut you off, but um, we do need to move on. And I know that there's lots that you could say about that, but let's hold that and uh, let's get to the next question and uh, see if we can um, expand the topic a little bit. Um, so I apologize for that, but let me go ahead and get to the next question. That is, when we are in the midst of conflict, a conflict mindset, and we're looking to join hands for peace, but that means that there's conflict. So when we're distracted by our differences with others that involve fears, resentments, and mistrust of others, how can we help de-escalate the animosity in order to foster the change in perspective for them to even want peace and focus on commonalities? How do we begin? Uh, Lewis, I'd like to start with you and answer that question, what your perspective is on that. Thank you so much. This is a beautiful question. And I, I personally been in, for example, in Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia, uh, Bosnia, a uh, Serbska Republic, for example, after the civil war. And when I was there as an international observer, what I, what I saw was the consequences of combining hate and fear. When you combine hate and fear, you can get to spaces where you can really create a, a situations that then are really, really difficult to, to repair. So I think that uh, I really believe in re regeneration, but this is something that you have to use after the conflict. During the conflict, uh, you have to really go and you have to negotiate and you have to use diplomacy as much as possible. But something important when we look at conflict is that you have prevention, you have mitigation and then you have regeneration. So I think that this is very important that we all understand that in order to end a conflict and do it in a way where we can all live together again, we have to bring the mentality of regeneration. And regeneration doesn't mean it means that you have to regenerate. It's a very easy word, but sometimes we forget that and we get in and we have to stop. And then we right. have to divide yeah so it's very okay it's very very important thank you so much uh lewis uh yes dr mcgee i'd like for you to have a take at that question well i think one of the things that we have to recognize is that when there's conflict we have to find commonality in everybody what is it that we can all agree upon and i think the one thing that we can all agree upon is that everybody is in favor of children why don't we use that as the mechanism to draw people together. A child is not black, white, Asian, Latino, Muslim, Christian, Jew, Buddhist, Hindi. A child is a child. And what we've seen over all these years is that in the, you know, 38 years we've been doing this, why have we been able to get 6,000 medical volunteers to donate their time? Why are we in 38 countries? Why have we operated on about 180 missions a year? It's because people come from all over to help a child. There is no diversity in that. And in seeing the result of the metaphor, it says involvement can create change. We come together as people and we start to understand one another's culture through the children that we help. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. McGee. Because we are running so late, I'm actually going to skip the last question that I had, and we're going to move directly to um, our, our closing statements. And so I will start us off. And my comment um, on, on my closing, and then I'll move to the rest of y'all's for a minute and a half that you will each have, 
is uh, until we see our own personal egoic lenses that affect our values, perspectives, and behaviors, we will continue to value, perceive, and behave in the similar ways that we have been. And this means that nothing in our societies will change until we change our own mindsets personally and consciousness states, which become the collective. And that is where we must begin, because when our personal belief systems and perspectives, values, and behaviors change, then and only then will the societal, political, economic, and other institutional systems change to reflect our change in consciousness states on a personal level, as within, so without. We must start being this higher self in our professional environments as we tend to be more often in our personal environments, despite the political, economic, and other pressures that exist in our professional lives. This means we cannot continue to point fingers of blame towards others and say, you need to be different or do differently. Change in our environments, including our institutions, is a ripple effect of being different as individuals within them. As Mahatma Gandhi said many years ago, you must be the change you want to see in the world. Change is an inside job. And I will add my own personal uh, saying to this, the global change is and can only be a result of individual ripple effects. The larger number of individuals change, the bigger the sphere of ripple effects will be. So I would like to now call upon others to um, introduce their closing statements for a minute and a half. So um, Ambassador Mahubani, I would like, and Professor, I'd like to start off with you and your perspective for the closing one and a half minute. I'll, I'll stick to my time because no, my point is a very simple one. When you talk about peace and you talk about conflict, you can become very pessimistic. But I want to end on a very optimistic note because if you, look, if you take a long-term view of history, the number of people dying from interstate conflicts has gone down like this, shoom, downwards. Especially in the 20th century, we had the big world wars in the first half. And now, as you know, there has fortunately been no, ma no major world war. We really want to ensure this trend continues. Let's find ways and means, number one, of strengthening the United Nations and of respecting the UN Charter. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, Ambassador Sarabai. Thank you. In conclusion, as a representative of uh, Multilateral Forum uniting 27 states, with the headquarter in the heart of Eurasia, I wish to stress that Asia seeking to consolidate itself based on the principle of the UN Charter. Absolutely agree with Ambassador. And uh, Asians can offer the world's uh, new effective tools to respond to the emerging threats. But, and then of course, the SICA uh, is one of such effective platforms established only 20 years ago. Uh, already approved uh, on its own experience that there is no alternative to multilateralism in achieving peace, security and prosperity, especially in geographic areas where conflicts, unfortunately, tensions or divergence of views still persist. And uh, dear friends, multilateralism again and again and inclusiveness are at the heart of the UN approach and are now proving to be the highest relevance again after times of unilateralism, unfortunately, driven by some member states to the international community. The only okay. bit and climate change, there are only few uh, uh, reasons why we should to be together. Thank okay, you. thank you so much. And we're going to go quickly. Um, Dr. McGee. Let me uh, just go back to um, 1987, my 25th high school reunion in New York City, when I was sitting down with a good old friend who was a Vietnam War veteran and came up to me and said, Bill, would you consider bringing Operation Smile to Vietnam? Because the Vietnamese have not returned our prisoners of war that were killed there, their bodies to the United States, and they haven't talked to us in 20 years. I said, I'd be glad to if we could. Through him, we ended up taking that trip to Vietnam in 1988, had our first mission in 1989, operated on about 120 kids together in Hanoi. Within three months of that visit, the MIAs started coming back to the United States. 
I'll just show you a little video because it's one thing for me to say that we have that relationship. It's another thing for Lee Dukan to say that in a little video at his death. Um, I'm sorry, Dr. McGee, we don't quite have time to do that. We've got, uh, I, I do need to move to another person. I'm so sorry. I know that was a very powerful video, um, but I do want to, uh, um, okay, so it's saying our original session time has lapsed, but we can stay as long as we want. Okay, so maybe there will be different, there will be people who are going to still watch us. So um, go ahead, play your video, Dr. Okay. McGee. I, I think the important thing is we'll play that video and we'll put that on. But it was him who said it, not me. And 30 years later, we're still in Vietnam side by side, having operated, go ahead, on about uh, 40,000 children there. Over